right, giving a little test here to see uh, if everything's working okay. It appears as though it is. This is my first stream on this channel, so um, please, you know, excuse me while I'm getting the settings kind of ironed out. And uh, the format you see on screen may not, you know, it may not be permanent and it may not exist like this in the long run as I try to figure out what's the best way to do this. All right, well, greetings, everybody. I know no one's watching this currently, but um, my name's Devin. I started the channel Magnus Veritas. Uh, you can watch the introduction video if you'd like. But basically, I've always been interested in learning all there is to learn and trying to expand my mind as much as possible. Uh, recently, during the pandemic, this has taken even more precedence than it ever has in my life. I've had more time on my hands than I know what to do with. So here we are, and I thought I'd try to start this channel as a little experiment. I don't know if it'll take off or go anywhere, but you know, I figure I owe it to myself to try. So today, what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be starting to read through um, the nature of the Ju uh, the nature of the judicial process by Benjamin and Cordozo. Uh, he was an associate Supreme Court justice, I believe. He I can't remember when he first started. I know I think believe this was written in 1936. Um, he's regarded by many to be one of the greatest associate Supreme Court justices ever. And this is kind of his pivotal text on his process of determining, you know, trying to figure out what determines justice. And, you know, in any individual case, you know, he has to figure out, you know, using his morals and conscience and conscious and unconscious decision making to to figure out what constitutes justice in any particular case and that's really what he goes back into here this is what he talks about in this book and yeah so this book is public domain unfortunately i couldn't find a good source that i can give you that i know is a legal source it's public domain so you pretty much just have to google it and you'll find it um, I can s try to supply it if you need to. I have a physical copy here in front of me, but I also have, as you can see, I have it up on the screen right here. Yeah, I have it all on the screen right here, and it looks like my cursor isn't being captured. I'll have to, you know, work that out. But yeah, so we'll be reading through this today, and um, I haven't fully decided on how this will work. I don't know if I'll be reading out loud the entire time, which seems better because I mean if I'm just sitting here staring at a text it's not exactly gonna be exciting will it but um, yeah uh, before I start though a few notes I know I haven't been very active on this channel mostly because I hate editing videos and I've made a few videos that are just in the process of being edited and it's taking forever so uh, that's why I figured I'd try out the live format and we'll see what happens Okay, like I said, uh, hopefully you have attained a copy. I'm sure if anyone watches this, they'll be mostly uh, on the recording. So there's that. But yeah, let's jump right into it. So the reason I chose this book is because it's, you know, a lot of people don't seem to understand the justice system today, and in the United States at least. And this book isn't going to give you like a lowdown on how it works, but it does give you the decision-making process that many judges will follow, at least ones that are scrupulous and, you know, attempt to um, attempt to use their morals and their logic in order to pr provide a proper sentencing if in case a criminal or a, a proper, you know, ensure a proper procedure in court. Um, there's some other great books that we'll be reading that I think you'll really enjoy, but that'll go a bit more in depth and I have a list of books that uh, needs to be updated but you'll see it soon anyway let's jump to it um, I've read about 40 pages of this so far so uh, I'm gonna be maybe uh, a little more up to speed I figured I should start at the beginning because if anyone's watching this it'll be weird for me to start from page 43 but um, okay yeah let's give it a start and we'll, we'll see what happens so this is the beginning of it. Lecture 1, Introduction, The Method of Philosophy. The work of deciding cases goes on every day in hundreds of courts throughout the land. Any judge, one might suppose, would have followed it a thousand times more. Wait. Man, I'm already... I need to, need to do a little thing. It's hard to pay attention to multiple things. Any judge, one might suppose, would find it easy to describe the process which he had followed a thousand times and more. Nothing could be farther from the truth. 
Let some intelligent layman ask him to explain. He will not go very far before taking refuge in the excuse that the language of craftsmen is unintelligible to those intutored in the craft. Such an excuse may cover with a semblance of respectability an otherwise ignominious retreat. It will hardly serve to st still the pricks of curiosity and conscience. In moments of introspection, when they're... might have to just read off the screen to make it a bit easier so that I'm not constantly clicking over. Let's see. Okay. In moments of introspection, when there is no longer the necessity of putting off with a show of wisdom the uninitiated... Uh, show of wisdom the uninitiated interlocutor so if you're not familiar with that word interlocutor means basically the person who's being in interrogated or spoken to the troublesome problem will recur and press for a solution what is it that i do when i decide a case to what sources of information do i appeal for guidance and what proportions do i permit them to contribute to the result and what proportions ought they to contribute if a precedent is applicable, when do I refuse to follow it? If no precedent is applicable, how do I reach the rule that will make a precedent for a future? If I am seeking logical consistency, the symmetry of the legal structure, how far shall I seek it? At what point shall the quest be halted by some discrepant custom, by some consideration of the social welfare, by my own or the common standards of justice and morals? Um, so uh, I, I figure I'll do little, little, you know, so in order to really learn from books like this and to, you know, internalize it, we have to not only understand what he's saying, but we really should step back and try to see how we feel on the process throughout the way. That's one thing I've really learned from reading more educational uh, topics. So what he's saying here is he's explaining, of course, how, you know, he's he's asking these in um, rhetorical questions of, you know, how does he decide something? How does he decide what's right, what's wrong? How does he make the choices he does as a judge? And he's, he's kind of he's kind of showing the process here. He's talking about how, you know, most most cases follow what's called a legal precedent where basically they look to the previous law, like uh, some other judgment in a similar case or in something that's applicable to the current uh, the current case. And they they use that to determine, you know, what what kind of whether if it's like I said, it depends on if it's criminal or if it's a civil litigation sort of thing. But they kind of look through to see. To make sure that there's some consistency in the court. That's the main reason they follow precedent. So he's just saying that there are questions he has to ask himself in order to, uh, to hand down a proper judgment. Into that strange compound which is brewed daily in the cauldron of the courts, all these ingredients enter in varying proportions. I am not concerned to inquire whether judges ought to be allowed to brew such a compound at all. I take judge-made laws one of the existing realities of life. There before us is the brew. Not a judge on the bench, but has not had a hand in the making. I don't know where I got not from. The elements have not come together by chance. Some principle, however unavowed and inarticulate and subconscious, has regulated the infusion. So he's saying, of course, judges, you're always, you always have something. The elements of uh, that judgment you're handing down whether you know it or not, there's some, there's some elements that have come together in your conscious or uh, subconscious mind to make it happen. I should probably scroll down all the way. It may not have been at the same principle for all judges at any time, nor the same principle for any judge at all times, but a choice there has been, not a submission to the decree of fate, and the considerations and motives determining that choice, even if obscure, do not utterly resist analysis. So we can... Obviously, even though it may be obscure what made a judge render a judgment or a, or a particular you know decision, but it may be obscure, but we can definitely figure it out, what made them decide on that. In such attempt at analysis, I shall make their sh between the conscious and subconscious. I don't mean, I do not mean that even though those considerations and motives which I shall class under the first head, they will always be recognized and named at sight. Not infrequently, they hover near the surface. They may, however, be with comparative readiness, be isolated and tagged, and when thus labels, quickly ac acknowledged as guiding principles of conduct. More subtle are the forces far beneath the surface that they cannot be reasonably be classified other than subconscious. It is often through these subconscious forces that judges are kept consistent with themselves and inconsistent with one another. We are reminded by William James in a telling page of his lectures on pragmatism 
Um, this is actually one of the things I actually want to read this. Um, uh, well, William James's uh, lectures on pragmatism. I really am interested, especially after reading this, but you'll see shortly. We are reminded by William James in a telling page of his lectures on pragmatism that every one of us has a truth and underlying philosophy of life. And even those of us to whom names, whom the names and notions of philosophy are unknown or anathema, there is each of us a tendency of a stream of tendency, whether you choose to call it philosophy or not, which gives us a coherence and direction to the thought and action. So, I mean, it's it seems pretty self-explanatory. Um, this these lectures by William James basically say that each of us has an underlying philosophy of life, and whether we call it philosophy or not. Um, they give us, they, they are what make us, this, uh, they are what guide us in our decisions we make in real life. Which give a co coherence and direction to thought and action. Judges cannot escape that current any more than the other mortals. All their lives, forces which they do not recognize and cannot name, have been tugging at them. Inherited instincts, traditional beliefs, acquired convictions... And the resultant is an outlook on life, a conception of the social needs, a sense in James' phrase of, quote, the total push and pressure of the cosmos, which when the reasons are nicely balanced, must determine where the choice shall fall. In this mental background, every problem finds its setting. We may try to see things as objectively as we please. Nonetheless, we can never see them with any eyes except our own. To that test, they are all brought, a form of pleading or an act of parliament. The wrongs of paupers, the rights of princes, of village ordinance, or a nation's charter. So, of course, what we're saying here is that let me make sure I can you can see my face, even though I need a, I need a shave. Um, what he's saying, of course, is that we each have our own philosophy, and everybody's is different. And though we can try to be as objective as we like, you know, we there's always going to be some biases in our in our thought process, right? There's always going to be something. That no matter we can say, okay, let's look at this objectively, we're always going to have some little naggling thought in our back of our mind that we our bias that we cannot avoid, even though we try our hardest. So that's a major problem. That's one of the biggest things in this um, in Magnus Veritas in my education, that I, my self education, my autodidactism, if you want, if you will, that I'm trying to make sure is that I start to acknowledge and understand my biases. Because, as, as it says, I try very hard to remain objective. And in many instances, I do. However, I do find myself occasionally, you know, I'll say, well, of course, or certainly this, or, and then I realize, well, I'm not that certain, because that's just some subjective idea I have of the situation. So, important to recognize. Let's continue. I have little hope that I shall be able to state the formula which will rationalize the process for myself, much less for others. We must apply to the study of judge-made law that method of quantitative analysis which Mr. Wallace has applied with such fine results to the study of politics. I've never actually read Mr. Uh, this book, Human Nature and Politics. Seems like an interesting read. Might add it to the list. A richer scholarship than mine is requisite to do the work or right. But until that scholarship is found and enlists itself in the task, there may be a passing interest in an attempt to uncover the nature of the process by one who himself is an active agent, day by day, in keeping the process alive. That must be my apology for these introspective searches in the spirit. He's saying that he doesn't have all the, all the answers, and, but he's, he's obviously, uh, as a judge, as an Associate Supreme Court Justice, he is... He works in it daily, so he's going to give his thought process to us. I do need to get some more water momentarily. That was my coffee mug. I'm sorry, that was probably extremely loud. Before we can determine the proportions of a blend, we must know the ingredients to be blended. Our first inquiry should therefore be, where does the judge find the law which he embodies in his judgment? There are times when the source is obvious. The rule that fits the case may be supplied by the Constitution or by statute. If that is so, the judge looks no farther. The correspondence ascertained, his duty is to obey. The Constitution overrides a statute, but a statute, if consistent with the Constitution, overrides the law of judges. Very important, our Constitution is our overarching law. It is the end-all, be-all. If something is not 
allowed by the Constitution. It is not allowed. It doesn't matter if it passed through the legislature, if it is found to be unconstitutional, it's not. And if it this the statutes are consistent with the Constitution, then it overrides the law of judges because the statute is binding in that, at that point. Let's continue. In this sense, judge-made law is secondary and subordinate to the law that is made by legislatures, what we just spoke of. It is true that codes and statutes do not render the judge superfluous, nor is work perfunctory and mechanical. There are gaps to be filled. There are doubts and ambiguities to be cleared. There are hardships and wrongs to be mitigated, if not avoided. Interpretation is often spoken as if it were nothing but the search and discovery of a meaning, which, however obscure and latent, had nonetheless a real and ascertainable pre-existence in the legislator's mind. Uh, I'm going to continue reading, but I do want to I do want to like go back on that momentarily. The process is indeed at that at times, but it is often something more. The ascertainment of attention may be the least of a judge's troubles in ascribing meaning to a statute. The fact is, says Gray in his lectures on the nature and sources of the law, another thing I'd like to read, that the difficulties of so-called interpretation arise when the legislature had no meaning at all, when the question is raised on a statute never occurred to it, and what, when what the judges have to do is not determine what the legislature did mean, on a point which was present in its mind, but to guess what it would have intended on a point not present to its mind if this point had so been present. Okay, so the going back, what he's saying is that, of course, if, if like, let's assume all law is consistent with the Constitution and infallible, even if those are, even if those are maintained, which they obviously aren't, we deal with on a constant day that laws are found to be unconstitutional, but even if they were correct, uh, judges are not superfluous. They are required in it because there are a lot of times, as we know, a lot of times a judge, all they have to do is look, well, I shouldn't say all they have to do, but their major goal is to sort out ambiguities, things that the people who wrote the code or the statute did not notice, things they did not think about, ways that it could, you know, uh, how it could completely, uh, completely be broken down by some one particular instance. Or perhaps loopholes that they didn't think about. Um, I mean, when you think loopholes these days, most people think a tax loophole, right? Things that in the tax law that somehow a person or a company get around, they get around paying their fair share of taxes because of some unseen circumstance in the way and the wording of the law. But what he's saying is, yeah, it's. Let's see. Let me read the doubts and ambiguities, the hardships. Yeah, so what he's talking about here is in Gray's nature of the sources and the sources of the law. He's talking they're talking about here is that interpretation arise when the legislature had no meaning at all. So we see this a lot where I, I, if, I, if I'm understanding this correct, it kind of goes back to what I just said about unforeseen circumstances. But it also works as in, in a sense of um, there are times lawmakers make a law with no idea what it's doing. It seems weird, and it seems, of course, like an oxymoron. It seems – it doesn't seem right, but there's times where they'll make a law for this fact of making this law. Maybe for some imagined slight or some small thing, but, <laughs> yeah, it's it, – they that they're saying that the lawmakers themselves didn't actually know what the law meant when they made it. They just had one goal in mind, and it kind of worked, right, and that was their ultimate goal. So that's what he's talking about here. And then judges, their goal, their their job is to sort that out, of course, to to clear up that misunderstanding or to give structure to the law as it was formed in the first place. So we're back here. Let's continue. So Brut, I'm assuming, what is this from? De Kunst der Rechtsanwendung. I know what that means, and I'm just like I can I can kind of I know a little bit of German and that <laughs> rights and something of law or something. I'm not certain. Some uh, uh, if a person who's German watches this, give me a little thing I could look it up. But so brut. 
I'm guessing he says, one weighty task of the system of the application of law consists then in this, to make more profound the discovery of the latent meaning of positive law. Much more important, however, is the second task which the system serves, namely the filling of gaps which are found in every positive law in greater or lesser measure. So he's talking, of course, about judges fill gaps, but then they also have to understand the meaning behind the law. What were they? Okay, now I think I'm getting it a bit more. So let's think of like if uh, I don't know if you if you've ever seen cases of constitutional law, which there are there are a bunch of some great sources. I would look into it more. But constitutional law, a lot of times we're there is an idea of whether we should look at the law as it is written or as it was meant. Right. There are obviously things that the framers of the Constitution said wrote in the law that. Yeah, they meant one thing for certain, but they had other things in mind. The biggest thing we see nowadays is the let's think Second Amendment, right? The right of the people to bear bear arms shall not be infringed. Now there's some wording in there, right? There's more to it, like when they talk about you know the right to uh, a well-regulated militia, but. What what they at what the what judges and people ask is they say well did they mean all people or did they just mean these militias, and you know and and there was more meaning behind what they said than just the words and then that's where the interpretation comes into play. So that's what he's talking about here is that part of the judges one of their things latent discovery profound discovery of the latent meaning of positive law what do they mean behind the surface what is you know what is understood what do they mean to say and what is uh, what is just meant to be understood by reading it you may call this process legislation if you will in any event no system of jus scriptum um why am i spacing on that i know that it's a legal term i mean it's latin of course let's Let's do a little a little thing here. So another way I'm going to do this, whenever there's a public domain book, I won't necessarily have a PDF, but I will go to my browser here. There we go. Where I have Wikisource up, or I'll use it for other things, of course. Um, but yeah, so let me get, clean up my bookmark bar a little bit. But yeah, what we're gonna do is we'll we'll look on Wikisource for P, uh, for public domain books. Which most, if you have never used Wikisource, I know almost everyone's used Wikipedia. This is an excellent source. If something, almost if anything's in the public domain, almost guaranteed it's here. Uh, it's still being updated over time, but yeah. So there's plenty of great books in here. I recommend, but we'll use this to uh, look up some uh, some various things. Uh, Written law, yeah. I would say scriptum. I knew jus, jus was law and scriptum was written, but I didn't know if it just meant written law. Okay, very simple. My Latin is kind of poor. I haven't studied it in a while. But it's pretty okay. So that makes sense. All right, let's see. I'll have to get some uh, hotkeys down on this, but there we go. No system of written law has been able to escape the need for, of it. Today, a great school of continental jurists is pleading for a still wider freedom of adaptation and construction. The statute, they say, is often fragmentary and ill-considered and unjust. The judge, as the interpreter for the community of its sense of law and order, must supply omissions, correct uncertainties, and harmonize results with justice through the method of free decision. Libera recherche scientifique. This is not Latin. This is maybe French scientifique. I'm not certain. I would assume uh, written or libra. I know in like Latin means book. I, I'm kind of bad at French, but book maybe written research, scientific research, legal scientific research, something like that. That is the view of Gene and Ehrlich and Gmelin and others. Yeah, that's definitely French. Courts are to search for light, for light among the social elements of every kind that are the living force behind the facts they deal with. The power thus put in their hands is great and subject like all power to abuse, but we are not to flinch from granting it. 
In the long run, there is no j guarantee of justice, says Ehrlich, except the personality of the judge. This is something, I mean, this, this, is, this is just kind of an offhanded statement he makes here, but it's true. We act as though these judges are infallible people many times, as if they are somehow privileged, right? They are, they are somehow omnipotent, omniscient, infallible. But the truth is they're people just like you and me. They are capable of, you know, moods. They are capable of biases. They are capable of, you know, all sorts of things that are, that kind of lower the effect of their, their dealing out judgments with proper justice. So that's why he's saying there's no guarantee of justice, the personality of the judge. So um, I don't know if you've ever, if, if you specifically have been to court or maybe you've heard about this, but there are times that judges are bound to give out higher judgments or let's say in a criminal case, they are given out higher sentencing simply because they're in a bad mood. Should it be that way? No, of course not. But judges are human and they are known to, you know, fall victim to the same things that you and I fall victim to anger, kind of annoyance. Um, there's a joke I've seen among lawyers. I have some friends who are lawyers and obviously things I've read online where, you know, a, a lawyer will be waiting to see the judge in court and then there'll be a case going on before him. Like, I don't know. I don't know all the legal terminology. I'm not going to pretend I'm not a lawyer. Although I hope maybe that'll change in the future. But where the other person will be, uh, the other lawyer who's in a different case before him will be just pissing off the judge so bad. And the lawyers who are waiting for their turn before the judge are like, hey, you know, stop. You're making him mad. And then they have to go after so then the judge is not going to be as lenient as he might otherwise be. Uh, I digress, but that's the idea of that the personality of the judge takes place. They are humans. They are the same as you and I. They may have a better understanding of the law, and, and hopefully they have a better um, control over their, their emotional response. But truth is, you can't be certain. And justice is overall just determined on what kind of person the judge is. I will return momentarily. I'm going to get a bit more water. Um, this one's kind of getting old now, so I'll be back shortly. Okay, sorry about that, need to get some water. Considering COVID, this is the first time I've read out loud this much in years, so <laughs> I apologize, let's get comfortable. All right, where were we? It is weird, uh, it is very weird me reading from the screen there yeah it's me reading off the screen instead of a book i'm much more of a uh <laughs> a print guy i do almost everything i read almost everything in print because it's i don't know it's, i'm trying to get better at reading on screens like i can read articles and stuff like that but i'm trying to get better at reading books on screens because there's so many free oh, public domain books out there like this one that saves a lot of money and i mean i could go to the library as well but it saves a lot of money to <laughs> to be able to read pdf so i'm working on that we'll see but it's just the eye strain and you know and like how i'm constantly sometimes i find myself inserting words or skipping lines or something like that it, it only happens when i'm reading on the screen i don't know what it is otherwise books i can i actually have a pretty quick reading speed all right Let's see, where was I? Okay. The same problems of method, the same contrast between the letter and spirit are living problems in our own land and law. 
what we were talking about earlier. Above all, in the field of constitutional law, the method of free decision has become, I think, the dominant one today. The great generalities of the Constitution have a content and significance that vary from age to age. Uh, exactly how we were talking about, like, with the Second Amendment. How one generation thinks one thing, the other something completely different. The method of free decision sees through the transit, transitory particulars and reaches that is permanent behind them. Interpretation thus enlarged becomes more than ascertainment of the meaning and intent of lawmakers whose collective will has been declared. It supplements the declaration and fills the vacant spaces by the same methods, processes, and methods that have built up customary law. Codes and other statutes may threaten the judicial function with repression, disguise, or disuse, and atrophy. The function flourishes and persists by virtue of the human need to which it steadfastly responds. Justinian's prohib prohibition of any commentary on the product of his codifiers is remembered only for its futility. I've actually never read Roman law. Um, I, I mean, I, I haven't. I mean, I know some some specific instances of Roman law. That's actually on my reading list. Um, I have a few things I would like to do before I'm actually gonna can finish reading uh, Gibbon's History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire. Um, but I also am gonna read the Annals by Tacitus, which should give me a lot more perspective on the way that the empire went through. At least the ones we have access to. But yeah, there's a lot of... Um, I know I'm going off on a tangent here and I should probably continue reading. But uh, one of the biggest things that people don't realize is that the United States government, while it is, of course, it's, it's kind of a unique thing in the world, but it was based very heavily off the Roman Republic. Um, there's a reason that all our legalese is in Latin. There's another reason where I, uh, that's another reason why our buildings, our government buildings look the way they do. Many of them were inspired by Roman architecture. Um, I, I, can, I don't remember if this is actually absolutely correct, but I'm pretty, if I remember correctly, the founding fathers and the framers of the constitution, when they were kind of being, you know, they, they were um, being seditionist or technically treasonous to the king, they used, they took on Roman names. They took on uh, the names of, I don't know what they were, I don't recall, but I can, uh, I mean, like, maybe one of, maybe one of them was Justinian, kind of like this, or maybe, maybe there were some other ones. I, I, like I said, look it up, it's very interesting stuff, but, like, yeah, there's a lot of, lot we can learn from, from Roman culture and civilization, and, because our, our entire country is basically based on it. All right, let's see. I will dwell no further on the moment upon the significance of the Constitution as statute and sources of law. The work of a judge in interpreting and developing them indeed has its problems and its difficulties. But they are problems and difficulties not different in kind or measure from those besetting him in other fields. I think they can be better studied when those fields have been explored. Sometimes the rule of Constitution or of statute is clear. And then the difficulties vanish. Even when they are present, they lack at times some of that element of mystery which accompanies the creative energy. We reach the land of mystery when constitution and statute are silent, and the judge must look to the common law for the rule that fits the case. He is the, quote, living oracle of the law, in Blackstone's vivid phrase. Looking at Sir Oracle in action, viewing his work in the dry light of realism, how does he set about his task? This We're going to start getting to the good stuff. The first thing he does is to compare the case before him with the precedents, whether stored in his mind or hidden in the books. I do not mean that the precedents are ultimate sources of law, supplying the sole equipment needed for the legal armory, the sole tools, to borrow Maitland's phrase, and quote, in the legal smithy. Back precedents are the basic jurid juridical, I, was, I wanted to say juridi jurisdictional, but no, juridical conceptions, which are the postulates of judicial reasoning. And farther back are the habits of life, the institutions of society, in which those conceptions had their origin, and which, by a process of interaction, they have modified in turn. Nonetheless, in a system so highly developed as our own, precedents have so covered the ground which fixed the point of departure from which the labor of the judge begins. So... I've actually, I, I didn't, I didn't think about this for a long time. Uh, one of the questions that I had was, 
why the big deal with precedence, right? Like we look at certain precedents and we let's say we look back in certain precedents. Um, for example, one of the one of the mo most I guess I don't know if it's most quoted, but it's one of the like biggest miscarriages of justice of precedent was that of the Dred Scott case. Um, if you don't know what that is, I would look it up. I highly recommend you look it up. Dred Scott was a slave who basically threw some through. I, I can't. I got to remember the details. Basically, he became free through some technicality of law, or so he argued. He educated himself, and he he kind of he became very well known as an educated slave who fought for his right in court, his rights in court. But the Supreme Court basically shot it down, saying uh, that he shouldn't be free. I don't remember the details. Like I said, I'm paraphrasing here. So take everything I say with a grain of salt. But it's it's things like that that make me say, why is that? That was a precedent that was made. That basically he wouldn't is not a free slave. And we look back at it now with disgust because we know slavery was abhorrent. But I, I could never figure out why precedent was so important in judges. And... I realized through a little bit of reading this and through, you know, a little bit of mental, mental gymnastics, I realized that mental gymnastics is not the term I should use. That usually means something completely different. But through, through a lot of thinking that it's consistency, right? It's is it, I wonder if he says that here. He says something like that. It's consistency, right? Let's say you, I go to court for a specific thing and then. I am given a judgment. Let's say I'm given a very harsh judgment. Uh, let's say, uh, let's assume it's criminal and I'm given some very harsh judgment. Then you go to court the next day or a week later for the exact, let's say your circumstances are the exact same, right? You, The judge should be following my precedent, the precedent set by my case. Let's say it was the first time it ever happened and, and then I got judged on it. Now, if the judge were to hand you a very light slap on the wrist for the ex I'm saying exact same thing, circumstances, exact same crime, what have you. That's a gross miscarriage of justice, is it not? I mean, it's one of those things that it seems simple, but you never really think about it. I'm thinking like, why is precedent so important? Why do they always ask, can you cite precedent? It's because precedent maintains consistency in the courts now there are times they should and i think he goes he'll go into this a little bit later where you should break from precedent where it should not be the end-all be-all of course but um losing my train of thought uh but it should be a very major player in your your thought process Almost invariably, the first step is to examine and compare them. If they are plain and to the point, there may be nothing need of nothing more. Stare decisis, or de decisis. So I pronounce my Latin with the classical um, pronunciation. Some people might call this stare decisis. Um, I'm, I've taken classical Latin classes, and I'll say stare decisis. Decisis. Just, my, just the way I pronounce it. I don't, it's, my pronunciation is probably not even proper, but that's the way I was taught. Stare de quisis is at least the everyday working rule of our law. Sorry, I thought it looked like my uh, stream was hiccuping there for a second. Let's, let's see, let's see what that is. Uh, uh, let's, let's do a little, little look into stare de quisis. The doctrine of pr or principle that precedent. Yeah, okay. Yeah, this is exactly what we're talking about. Okay. To stand by things decided. There we go. This is exactly what we were just talking about with consistency. Interesting. Okay. Sorry if you hear my cat yowling in the background. She's being kind of weird. Um. <laughs> Where was I? Stare de quisis is at least everyday wor working rule of our law. 
I shall have something to say later about the propriety of relaxing the rule in exceptional conditions. Exactly what I was talking about. But unless these conditions are present, the work of deciding cases in accordance with the precedents that plainly fit them is a process similar in nature to that of deciding cases in accordance with the statute. It is a process of search, comparison, and little more. Some judges seldom get beyond that process in any case. Their notion of their duty is to match the, is the case at hand upon the colors of the many sample cases spread upon their desk. And now my cat's coming to bug me. Hi, hi, what do you want? Of course. The sample nearest in shade supplies the applicable rule, but of course no system of living law can be evolved in such a process and no judge of a high court worthy of his office views the function of his place so narrowly. If that were all there was to our calling, there would be little of intellectual interest about it. The man who had the best card index in the, of the cases would also be the wisest judge. It is when the colors do not match, when the references in the index fail when there is no decisive precedent that the serious business of the judge begins he must then fashion law for the litigants before him in fashioning it for him it'd be fashioning it for others the classic statement is bacon's quote for many times the things deduced to judgment be may be meo mentum when the reason and consequence thereof may be trenched to the point of a state the sentence today will make the right and wrong of tomorrow this is what he means by state in that uh its state means long lasting of course if the judge is to pronounce it wisely some principles of selection there must be to guide him among all the other principal judgments complete for recognition or that compete for recognition i'm going to take a brief uh, brief break here make sure you know i don't overdo my voice yeah of course she's being noisy but um it's about 40 minutes i might i might stop streaming for now in order to uh I need to test the levels. I need to make sure everything's sounding okay and make sure everything's good with the, the video capture as well. So I will end it here, um, and we will continue reading from this on the next stream. It may be later today. It may be tomorrow. Like I said, this is just kind of a test stream currently. Um, I am hoping that some people watch this at least in recording form. And thanks for watching, and you know we'll continue this later.